Yo guys, what is up? It is Nick. We are back, and today I'm going to be talking about 10 things that you can do to both help you out and 10 things to keep the game interesting once you get higher level. So, let's start out with, first, the use of Lucky Eggs. So, currently, you know, everybody tells you to use Lucky Eggs for evolutions, okay, which is what you should do if you're limited to Lucky Eggs. But I buy Lucky Eggs because I'm a degenerate and I spend money on a free app. But... You also want to use them, first of all, for hatching eggs. So hatching eggs give you experience based on how far it takes to hatch them. So a 2km egg gives you 200 experience, 5km 500, and 10km 1000. So I have 8 5km eggs set to pop off at the same time. I'm going to pop a lucky egg before I hatch them, and I will get 8000 experience from it instead of the 4000 I would. It's quick, it's easy. And also, after you do that, go try to catch some Pokemon. Uh, at least do curve throws that you get to 200. If you're, if you, with Lucky Eggs activated for catching Pokemon, if you are better at just throwing it without a curve to get nice greats and excellence, just get the nice greats or excellence. Because they're worth more experience than the curve. The curve is only worth 10 experience. So it's not a huge deal if you miss out on that if you're getting a great throw every time because a great throw is worth 50. So with a with 50 experience from a great throw, if you add in double XP, you're getting 300 experience per Pokemon caught. And so it's just much more worth it to get 100 experience for the great throw instead of 20 for the curved throw. I've gotten pretty good at curved greats on certain Pokemon, on Weedles and Caterpies and Rattatas. I don't know, I just struggle to get the great throws on them. But on most other Pokemon, I can throw curved greats if I'm trying to. A lot of the time, I'm just curving it, and if it hits a great or a nice, that's whatever. I just want it to hit the Pokemon, because usually I don't have a Lucky Egg on. But if I have a Lucky Egg on, you really want to maximize your experience. So when you're catching Pokemon, make sure you're getting great throws over throwing a curved ball. I think, yeah, it is worth more still to throw a, to throw a great over a curved nice throw. So just go ahead and try to get yourself greats. And excellence are just icing on the cake if you can go ahead and catch Pokemon um, with curved greats or curved excellence. Uh, also, with lucky eggs, try to spin Pokestops. Because if you spin a Pokestop, you're going to get 100 experience, plus you're going to get items. The items... Let's forget about those because that's not what is important here. But you'll get 50 experience regularly for spinning a Pokestop. With a Lucky Egg, you'll get 100. So once again, maximizing your experience. So the best bet is to walk around in a chain of Pokestops, preferably 10 or 11 Pokestops. I'll get to that in just a second. But preferably 10 or 11 Pokestops with an incense on as well so that you can catch Pokemon with curved or great throws, um, whatever. Just make just make sure you do something. Don't just throw the Pokeball at the Pokemon with a Lucky Egg on and not get even a nice throw or a curved throw. Just just at least get something. Get yourself a little bit of bonus XP. Uh, but make sure you're walking in a circle because you can make a, a revolution of about 10 Poke stops usually in about 10 minutes. You can do it about three times, which would equal... What is that? B... 33, no, 3,300 experience, yeah, I think it'd be 3,300 experience, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 3,300 experience, which brings me to the next point I wanted to make, which is, after the 10th, after every 10th unique, po sometimes it's the 11th, uh, but I've noticed sometimes the 10th one doesn't always spit it out, sometimes it's the 11th, but it's usually the 10th, but after every 10th unique Pokestop, you get a Super Pokestop, which gives you a I think it's six plus items. Uh, a lot of the time it's just a bunch of Pokeballs, but that's fine. But for the purposes of the Lucky Egg talk is that it gives you 100 experience instead of 50. So it'll double that up and it'll be 200 experience, which I believe would add the extra 300. No, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would add the extra 100 three times, which would be 3,300 experience for walking that circle of Pokestops. It doesn't have to be a circle. It can be a straight line. Whatever. You know what I mean. Second, we'll move on to, I guess this is third. Third is wait to evolve. Uh, you guys have seen me doing it more recently. I didn't do it at the beginning of the game, but 
Unless it's the last Pokemon you need for your Pokedex, which that wouldn't make any sense, because why would you need the second evolution but not the third? See, that just doesn't make any sense. Not many people are going to end with that with that scenario. Most people in general are probably going to end up with Porygon or Dragonite as their last Pokemon they need. Or a region exclusive, I guess. Probably far-fetched for most people. Uh, no, no, probably... Probably Kangaskhan for most people because a lot of people take business trips to Europe and Asia and vice versa. Like, Europe, European people take vacations to Asia. Okay, you know, those three, they they take business trips or just take vacations in general. Not a ton of people. People do take vacations, but not a ton take vacations to Australia. So, I'm guessing Kangaskhan will be the last one for a lot of people. But... Back to my point is, is that if you wait until the end to evolve a three-stage Pokemon, like a Nidoking will use, for example, you might as well wait. What's the point of evolving into a Nidorino when you have 25 candies? What's the point of that? Other than you add up a new Pokemon in the Pokedex, which is, woo, so exciting. It maximizes your experience. It maximizes the CP and the IVs of your Pokemon if you just wait. You wait until you get 125 candies in order to evolve to the third stage from the first stage. You can maximize your CP, IVs, and you can just maximize. You can ju It's just the most efficient way to evolve because then you don't end up with, oh, I evolved this 600 oddish into a gloom. I don't know why I switched Pokemon. Okay, I evolved this 450 Nidoran, Nidor, Nidoran male into a Nidorino. Oh crap, I just got a 520 Nidoran male. Well, now I want to evolve that. So you just tend to waste, tend to waste. A lot of these are going to be basic, but a lot of them are things just to keep in mind. Remember, I guess that's what I'll title this video. 10 things to keep in mind. All right, next. So eggs... Let's go, let's go to eggs. Eggs are updated about every minute. Now, I don't think that's exactly correct because it usually takes mine like two minutes to update, two or three. And so the most efficient route to walk or drive or ride a bike is in a straight line because the game does not update on zigzags or circle patterns or stuff like that. It marks distance from point A to point B. So, whether you, whether point A is, you walked an equivalent of five kilometers from point A to point B, okay, but the straight line path from point A to point, okay, this is a bad example, you usually can get like 0.3 or 0.4 kilometers per update, so I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it like that. So, from point A to point B is like four is technically 0.5 kilometers, okay? You move that far to get there. If from point A, which wherever that is, to point B in the straightest of line, that's how much distance the, the game is going to give you for your eggs. So, if you go in a straight line, you want to wait for the game to update. Because if you walk 0.2 kilometers, okay, and then you turn around and start heading back before it's updated, it's only going to give you credit from where it registers. So say you started at point A and you walked 0.2 kilometers and quickly turned around and started walking back the other way. Usually it updates around 0.3, 0.4. By the time you got about halfway and it updated, it would only give you about 0.1 kilometers towards your eggs. It, would, it gives you a little bit more because I think it realizes that you walked and then you walked back some distance, but it does subtract some of the distance. So if you're driving in a straight line, just pull up, check the app before you get to the point B, uh, just a little bit before that and see what it says. And then when you get to point B, let the game update, then go ahead and turn on around and head back to where you were going. And now let's move on to use of incense. So I waste my incense a lot because I use them at home and I use them everywhere and I use them when I'm even lured up because I want more, more and more Pokemon to spawn. But the most effective way to use incense, if you're not going to buy a ton and you just want to use them to be the most effective, you can also use this to be most effective even if you do buy them, which I do, is to use your incense in low cell usage or low data areas, such as at your house, depending on, you know, if you live in a rural area at your house, that's low cell usage, low data, 
minimal amount of Pokemon are going to spawn there. Uh, or, you know, if you go out onto a lake, that's low cell service or cell usage and low data. So that's another place you would, you could use it. Um, just anywhere where there's limited cell activity. There we go. That's the word. That's the words that I was looking for. Limited cell cellular activity. That's the most effective places to use incense because you're not going to find Pokemon there anyway. So you might as well use an incense so that you can at least find some Pokemon. Now, incense has become even more effective if you're moving, I think it's at least 200 kilometers. Is it every... I think it's just every 200 meters you move, it spawns a Pokemon, I think it's every two minutes instead of every five minutes if you're sitting still. But still, if you're sitting still, it's still four to six Pokemon per half, per incense, per half hour. It kind of depends on when the first one, because sometimes the first um, Pokemon at the incense will spawn within the first five minutes. Sometimes it won't spawn in the first five minutes, which eliminates one. And then sometimes there won't be one that spawns in the last five minutes, which can eliminate two Pokemon. Can eliminate one, two, or none, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, usually it only eliminates one at one end. Usually you get about five Pokemon per incense. Sometimes you can get a little bit lucky if you're sitting in one spot. And you can get seven or eight, but I wouldn't ever bank on that. Next is the opposite. In high cell uh, usage areas or high cellular activity, such as gas stations, restaurants, theaters, stadiums, um, small parks, like small parks in big cities, I guess, and those... Um, department stores, malls, stuff like that, high cellular usage areas tend to spawn more Pokemon. So, you know, if you're at a, like, I'm going to be doing a video, I'm going to the Michigan, uh, the opening game against Hawaii. I'll do a vlog thing. I don't know how much I'm going to record there, but I'll show different parts of the stadium and whatnot. Uh, there's going to be over a hundred thousand people there, probably close to 110,000 people at the game. So that's a lot of cellular activity. I'll definitely be pulling out my phone and checking on Pokemon during um, commercial breaks and stuff like that when there's no activity going on. Obviously, I'm there to watch the game, but I am going to pull it out and check during uh, and halftime and before the game because I always get to the game about half hour, 45 minutes early. And so I'll probably check out before the game and all of that different stuff. But I will be checking Pokemon and really getting an idea of how crazy it can be with 100,000 people in one th in one stadium seeing uh, how many Pokemon may spawn. Uh, so just keep in mind, you know, when you pull up at a gas station on a road trip, just take out your phone, take a quick look. Uh, same with restaurants. When you're going out to eat, when you pull up, just take a quick look. Same with going to the movies or going to a sporting event at a stadium or whatever you may go into at a stadium. Most people are going there first sporting event, but there are other, there are other events that get put on it, uh, sports stadiums. All right, next, start saving Pokemon for trades. We're not sure how trades are going to work. There's a few theories that I'm going to go over right now, uh, which this applies, start saving Pokemon for trades anyway, whether or not it's any of these, but some of them warrant more, um, uh, ch -ch -ch. Gives you more of a reason to save certain Pokemon than other. First is that they're already confirmed that they're going to be adding new things that you can put in at Pokestops. New modules. One thought is that they're going to put a trade module in. So you put a trade module into a Pokestop and then anybody that shows up can trade at the Pokestop. Which would be an annoying way to do trading. Like a really annoying way. And I really hope it's not done like this, but it makes sense. They're going to put more modules in. It's a way to get people to spend more money in order to trade. But if you live in a small city, who are you going to trade with? <laughs> you have to get lucky that there's people at the same Pokestop as you when you module it up. Next is person to person. So you just got to be in range of your phones. You connect to each other by being close. And then you just trade Pokemon. It's face to face, person to person. Uh, and while this may create some... I don't know, shady, shady things. I'm not sure I'd want to meet random people to trade face to face, but this is another viable option. It goes back to the old days when you had to connect your Game Boys by link cable or you just had to be connected to the same Wi-Fi in order to trade. This is another really good um, 
theory on what trading could possibly be. The next is like the new games. You just trade over the internet. You trade online. They'd add a tab into the game. Most likely, it would be a third. It'd be a third tab next. It'd be Pokemon Eggs and then Trades or Online or whatever they would call it. And this is how the game works now. So if you want to trade Pokemon online um, in the new games, you can just trade them over the internet. You can just trade your Pokemon over the internet, and that's kind of how people are used to it who play the game. You trade your Pokemon online, simple as that, and you're done. So that is the option that I personally hope happens. I get the whole thing with trading Pokemon face-to-face -face or at a Pokestop or whatnot. I get the appeal of that. But you would need to go to big cities to trade. And then also trading couldn't help you acquire Kangaskhan, Forfetched, Mr. Mime, or Tauros, whichever three you're not in the region of. The best would be on to be on like the borders of a region, like be on the border of like Russia and the Ukraine, so that you could just hop the border and <laughs> catch the Pokemon you needed. If you wanted to go back and forth, you could get Mr. Mime and Farfetch. I think that's the only one that you could really do. I guess you could go um Russia to Alaska, and that'd be North America, Asia, but other than like those two spots, there's not really anywhere else that you connect to two different continents, but it would really severely limit your chances of getting Mr. Mayim, Kangaskhan, Farfetch'd, or Tauros, whichever ones you need, if you can't trade online, if you gotta trade face-to-face. -face. You'd have to get lucky to meet someone, like a foreign exchange student, or just something like that from one of those countries, and trade like that, or hatch them from an egg. It hasn't been 100% confirmed, but it's widely believed that you can hatch them. I haven't personally hatched a Kangaskhan, Mr. Mime, or Farfetch'd from an egg, but I think I've seen some on YouTube. I'm pretty sure. I've heard people say it's not 100% confirmed, but I think it pretty much is 100% confirmed, because I think I've seen it. But, start saving the Pokemon for trades. Depends on which one they go, because... If it has to be face-to-face -face or it has to be through a Pokestop, saving your region-specific Pokemon, like a bunch of them up, is going to be worthless. I've started saving a little bit of Tauros, pretty much anything 600 CP or above. I started saving Tauros, but if I can only trade with people right next to me or at a Pokestop or within X amount of distance, those are worthless. I'll just end up transferring them. Same with some other Pokemon uh, that are real common to my area, but aren't as common to others, like Bellsprout, Oddish, and, uh, what was the other one? Crap, I forget the other Pokemon. There, there's three Pokemon that are really common to my area that aren't common to others, so those would be good trade baits for other areas, like trading with, uh, people from LA, for example. I could trade Bellsprouts for Rhyhorn, Sandshrews, Cubones, which are ones I really need, or trade Oddishes, or trade Bugs, even though I wouldn't get a lot for Weedles and Caterpies, they're still kind of rare in some areas of the world, such as Los Angeles. I know a lot about the Pokemon that spawn in Los Angeles. I have a cousin who lives out in LA, and uh, he plays it, so I get a lot. I talk to him a lot about what Pokemon he finds out there and all that different stuff. But next is saving Pokemon for second generation. Now I talked about this with saving candies up, but you can also start saving up Stardust for second generation, which doesn't necessarily mean saving Pokemon for second generation, but you can start saving Stardust for second generation. My goal is to always be over 100,000 after a certain point. Once I get my Arcanine and Ninetales powered up, okay, then I'll start definitely staying over 100k until after Gen 2 comes out. Then I'll probably blow all of my Stardust on Gen 2 Pokemon, and then I'll grind back up over 100k for Gen 3. That's still a ways away, but you know what I mean. Want to be, start saving up Stardust so you can power up the Pokemon from Gen 2 that you want. Also start saving up the candies like I already talked about for Gen 2. Oddishes, Poliwags, Slowpokes, Zubats, Scythers, Chanseys, Onix, Porygon. Yeah, good luck saving up a bunch of Porygon candies. Is that it? Was there eight? I might be forgetting a Pokemon, but I think I think I got them all. It doesn't matter. You guys know. Go watch that video if you haven't. It goes over all the new Pokemon uh, coming out in Gen 2 that have Gen 1 Pokemon that evolve into the Gen 2. So go check that out if you don't if you haven't already. 
Second is, or second, ninth is check all out all your local parks, theme parks, and just big areas that are like an establishment, like parks, you know, on Google Maps, a park is a big area that's a park. Like it knows that from this, this large area is all one park and it knows a theme park. This large area is a theme park because usually large areas tend to be nests. Parks and theme parks are the most common for nests. And just go and check out all your local parks and theme parks. See also zoos. I mean, zoos are nests a lot of the time. Those are places that are nests. Go check them out because not a lot of data has been collected on nests. So not a lot is known about what nests are where and what Pokemon are at each nest and all of that. So it's a lot of research you need to do on your own. I Next week, I think, I'm going to go and start checking out a lot of the other parks around me. I know there's an Electabuzz nest that I've already been to that I found one Electabuzz, but it is an Electabuzz nest. It was a Magmar nest. And then I was one day late and it turned into an Electabuzz nest. And then I couldn't find many Electabuzz. Uh, next is the Vulpix Park that turned into a Clefairy Park. There's a, uh, there's a, what you call it, a, a Caterpie, or no, it's a Weedle Nest. No one wants a Weedle Nest, okay? So that one's pointless. There's a Weedle Nest at a park near me. And then the theme park near me, um is under it's it's a water park it's kind of a, it's got a few like regular rides but it's more of a water park uh but it's under renovation but i think it's a it was a poly wag nest whatever poly wag turned into whatever the next basic pokemon in the pokedex is is what it is now but it was a poly wag nest but i haven't done a whole lot of research there's still a ton of parts i need to go check out but Go and check out your local parks. They may have the Pokemon that you're looking for because right now without really being able to track any Pokemon, it's really hard to find the Pokemon that you need. So parks and eggs currently are your best bet in order to get the Pokemon that you want slash need. Finally, this is more for not for the casual or the new players to do, but it's to check your IVs. I use Poke Assistant because it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't access the game's code. It doesn't. You don't log in with your Google account for them to view your account. It's all with an IV calculator. Now it's not 100% accurate because it gives you ranges that it could be. For some of them, it gives you the 100%. It or not 100%. It tells you exactly what percent perfection it is as well as the IVs for some Pokemon. Some can have three different things. It could be some have like nine. Um, but it, it helps you narrow it down. It helps you know at least if it's a good or horrible Pokemon, uh, at least. And it's something else to do once you get higher level. Like, I'm level 25, and there's not a lot for me to do with the game. I'm not finding new Pokemon every day. I'm not finding the Pokemon I need every day. So, consequently, I need to find more, enter more things to entertain me with this game because I love it. So, one of those things has been IVs. And I've really been getting into them a little bit more. I didn't think I'd actually get into them because the battling in, within the game isn't all that competitive. You can take a gym with a with 0% perfection from its IVs, and you can beat three Pokemon with 15 uh, perfect. Uh, you, could ha you could take three Pokemon with perfect IVs. So, as of this point, IVs aren't wildly important, but there are something, uh, there's something in the game to have fun and to use and to see... And just compare your Pokemon. You might as well do it if you're going to evolve. If you have, say, three Growlithe that are all roughly between 740 and 760, you might as well check the IVs for them, see which one's the best, and evolve that one. Because why not have the most optimal one that you can have? Unless you're just lazy, which sometimes I am. But it takes two seconds to do it. All you got to do is type in the name of the Pokemon. It's combat power, it's health. How much Stardust it takes to power it up, and if it had been powered up yet or not. And other than that, you just click Calculate, and it tells you the the different ranges of perfection that it may be, or the singular perfection, which is really nice when it tells you just one, because then you know exactly how good your Pokemon is. You don't have to kind of guess. But guys, those are just kind of ten little tips that I had uh for just general things to re I, it's like general things to remember as well as stuff that you can do uh to keep yourself entertained with the game when 
you get to higher levels or you're just not finding the Pokemon you want, need, or aren't are just not finding Pokemon at all because you live in a rural area or out in the middle of nowhere. But guys, that's going to do it. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace out.